Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. It certainly is. Hi, everybody. It's Sunday evening. Means another Dreamland. This will be a good one. My guest is Michael Paul Lindemann, head of the 2020 group, who looks to the future based on present trends. In other words, based on what's happening right now, what's going to happen then. And he'll be along in short order. First, I'd like to welcome a brand new affiliate to the program. That would be 3WI. <laughs> what a great set of call letters. 3WI uh, in Brainerd, Minnesota. That's, that's wonderful. That's actually uh, WWWI, and they call it 3WI, and I think that's great. Brainerd, Minnesota, welcome to the program. You'll get the idea of what it's all about as we proceed. There is live uh, listener participation, so um, stand by, and in due course, we'll have the telephone lines open. A regular feature of this program is a gal named Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, who you may recall uh, last week uh, had a death in the family, the passing of her father, and uh, was not with us last week, is back this week in Philadelphia. And so, without hesitation, let us go to Linda Moulton Howe in Philadelphia and find out how she is. Linda, good evening. Hi, Art. Uh, I, I really appreciate your acknowledgement of my uh, father last week. Uh, the funeral on uh, Wednesday uh, turned out to be a large assemblage of people in aviation from all over uh, in Idaho and other parts of the country because he had been very involved in uh, the building of airports for private aviation and it was, um, I know someplace, uh, he's out there now flying, so, and is out of his pain, and I'm, for that, I'm grateful. Um, we are also, today, two weeks away and counting from the Shoemaker Levy Comet pieces. That's right. That are to begin, uh, according to astronomers, uh, piece by piece by piece, plunging into uh, the gaseous, hydrogen gaseous surface of Jupiter, and that should begin somewhere on uh, July 16th. So we will try to stay up with what's happening there. And for that reason, I have um, a Richard Hoagland coming on the program July 10th. All right. And I will also try to stay up with uh, some astronomer colleagues uh, to give a report that following Sunday. And two weeks ago, uh, on June 21st, uh, Dennis Claiborne in Garnet, Kansas, uh, found his second mutilation since August uh, on a farm uh, in Garnet, Kansas, about uh, 60 miles outside of Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, where the two cities are across the river. And uh, just uh, a three or four days before he found those two mutilated uh, animals, uh, or the one mutilated animal uh, that was following the August one, in Oregon, People were beginning to report to sheriff's office, uh, deputies in Washington County outside of Portland a series of circles that were appearing along U.S. Highway number 26. I just heard something about that, Linda. Yeah, I have received a photograph of it, and from the Oregonian newspaper, uh, it says that the, in the waist-high wheat was a circle about 35 feet across. It was ringed by a second circle of completely untouched wheat that was standing. And that was surrounded by a ring. And when you look at the picture, it is a flattened circle uh, that is about 35 feet across, surrounded uh, by a larger ring. And then in four different compass points, north, east, south, west, are four smaller circles placed at those compass points outside of the circle in the ring. And they were placed on the north side of a hill, just high enough to be seen from uh, Highway US 26. And there was a point where the Washington County Sheriff's deputies were having quite a challenge trying to control traffic because literally hundreds of people were stopping with camcorders and cameras uh, to take pictures of this uh, 
formation, and there was one man, Chris Ullman, he said, how did they get the circles so precise in the dark? It would seem like you would need a light source. This is a, quite a precise one, and we're now all waiting to see if anything more like this will occur in the United States, so if there are any listeners uh, in any area um, that uh, have some access to going out to where there are any kind of food and cereal crop fields, uh, we are now into that phase where we're trying to keep up with any formations that might be occurring someplace. And this particular one, whether it was made by a human or something else, uh, was on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. Uh, Linda, what would you recommend to people? Because a lot of times when these crop circles form, uh, there's just not enough time to get to it for scientific investigation. And before people like you do, uh, the, the fields are trumped by, uh, you know, busy bees, uh, rubberneckers, and people who want to see, and it all gets uh, fouled up. Right. Well, I'll tell you, right now, um, yeah, in fact, I'm happy to give uh, my phone number uh, on the air for this because Dr. Levengood, the biophysicist in Michigan that I've been working with for the last four years, has been getting uh, some plants from England and is very interested in getting plants from any of these formations that might occur in Canada and the United States, and probably the fastest way is to get in touch with me. So uh, before I uh, go into to a, a brief excerpt from an interview with the Kansas farmer uh, about his most recent mutilation and helicopter activity in the area. I wonder, Art, why don't I just give my phone number and people could contact me who are listening wherever in the United States. Um, they, it, it's a gutsy thing to do, Linda. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Well, um, it, it, this is the only way I know to make this contact in terms of reports. So Fast, yes. The number would be area code 215-491-9848. And I will uh, talk with people, and we will see if there is some formation uh, that uh, does occur someplace. We will try to work with Dr. Levengood uh, to get plants to him, and so I would be the contact point. Okay, Linda, but there are a lot of people listening, and uh, so you better qualify it. Uh, the, the only calls you want are ones that uh, are connected to crop circles? Uh, crop circles, and I suppose if somebody uh, also it would in their area have heard about some uh, recent mutilation since they are occurring in a variety of isolated parts of the country right now, uh, I certainly could uh, take a call on that, too. All right. With those being the parameters, area code 215-491-9840, Linda moulton Howe. Okay, Linda. Now, I'd like to share with you a portion of a conversation with farmer Dennis Claiborne, who lives in Garnett, Kansas. He found one of his cows mutilated with the classic bloodless excisions of ear, eye, tongue, Mm -hmm. uh, genitals and rectum. The first was August 31st. The second was a uh, young heifer, a little over a year old, found on June 21st uh, in his farm in Garnett, Kansas. And when uh, we pick up uh, this particular part of the uh, interview, I'm asking him about the comparison between uh, the two mutilations on his farm. In the other one, how uh, similar was the August 31st mutilation to this uh, new young heifer this week? It was the exact same mutilation. There was no difference. Everything was the same? Yeah, the cut might have been just a little rougher on the heifer than it was the uh, cow, but... Uh, not that much. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, the color of the tissue? Well, you, you can see in the photos that we're sending you that the tissue was extremely white on the pepper. Mm -hmm. as, as if there was no blood in the uh, capillary. There wasn't no blood nowhere. Mm -hmm. in the and uh, you didn't see uh, signs of struggle or tracks around this heifer in the grass this time. Which are what? Any signs of struggle or tracks around the uh, heifer? Not around the heifer, but just that, ra that ring in the grass. Right, the ring in the grass. Um, now, it, I understand that you have seen helicopter activity in and around this pasture uh, recently? Yeah, about two, three months ago, or something like that, a couple months ago, I called the sheriff's department in, in another 
work in the other county right across the four right on the county line and asked them if they had anything on a helicopter going down and they said not at their knowledge at that time they didn't know anything about it but you could sit out there behind the barn we were working cattle and you could hear it run off in the distance perfect so you could hear the sound of a helicopter yep but you didn't see it never did see it and uh, did you ever hear the sound of a helicopter at night this was at night it was at night yeah, this, it, every time we've heard it was been at night and no running lights no beams and that, of course, has been one of the constant themes for the last 30 years of people hearing the sound of a helicopter in a pasture area and not seeing anything or seeing what looked like a beam of light coming out of what people describe as looking like a helicopter. But in those cases, they often are silent. And that ring that he referred to around this most recent mutilation, they, I've seen the photos now, and where the animal was found, it was more like a half circle of trampled uh, the grass, the pasture grass was, I don't even know if you could say trampled, but certainly laid down not in the precise way of a crop circle certainly, but it is unusual that there is this sort of half circle of trampled grass around this uh, mutilated heifer. I must tell you, Linda, this phenomenon is driving me nuts, <laughs> and now we have the addition of the helicopters, right. and um, you know, you have to ask this question. Um, helicopters would at least lead one toward government involvement, or the question of government involvement. And then you've got to sit back and say, now what the hell would our government uh, have to go to some farmer's field uh, to get a cow uh, to, to, to cut up? Uh, the, the answer is the government would not need to do that. That's right, and every law enforcement officer I've ever talked to since I first did a strange harvest 14 years ago has said this is not the way the government would operate. They would simply yeah. buy the animals that they needed, take That's them onto right. some military place, and they would take whatever it was that they needed. And I think it's also important to report about uh, seven years ago, a man who, uh, as far as I know, works for intelligence in the United States government, told me without my being able to ever name him or the source, but said that our government does monitor frequencies of what they consider to be non-human entities, and these frequencies that come from uh, different vehicles or lights uh, can be tracked and monitored, and when they pick up these signals that certain teams are scrambled to areas uh, in an effort to both monitor and possibly break up the action and he indicated to me mm -hmm. that this was done both in areas where there were mutilation activity and where there were abduction reports. Wow, that's what I say to that. Wow. Uh, did he happen to tell you any of those frequencies? No. Uh, those are the kinds of things that when you get into details, uh, none of us really Really ever get, and that may or may not be wise on the part of uh, some of the people in the government who have some assignments uh, in some of this. They're monitoring, and I think they monitor. Uh, in, I don't. I don't think the government has all the answers, Art. I think that uh, the government, like we, are trying to uh, struggle with a phenomenon that is so complex and ever changing that they themselves must study it. That then would would certainly make sense. Uh, that's very intriguing, Linda. Uh, and if you can find out any more, or if anybody out there knows any more about this, call me. Call Linda. <laughs> that's right. All right, um, Linda. A fascinating report. Thank you, and I will look forward to next week. And my best to Michael Lindeman, uh, and uh, hopefully I can uh, talk with him soon too. I know you'll have a good conversation with him. I know he wants you to give him a call. All so, right. So do that. Thank you, Linda. Take care. Take care, Linda. Linda Bolton Howe. Wow. Um, now, that is the first that I have ever heard um, that suggested, that there may be frequencies of operation of these craft and that they are monitored. And when something is heard in a specific area, a team is dispatched. All of a sudden, that would make some sense. In just one moment, Michael Paul Lindemann. Michael Lindemann was born in Milwaukee in the state of Wisconsin, home of our new affiliate uh, tonight, 3WI, in uh, 1949. 
He became a conscientious objector as a university student during the Vietnam War, developing a lifelong interest in arms control, foreign affairs, and government policy. He earned a BA degree in psychology from Antioch University, followed by two years of study at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. He later combined his political and psychological interests as an educator, social analyst, analyst, and futurist, first as executive director of the Peace Resource Center of Santa Barbara, then as founding director of the 2020 Group, which is a private research organization studying forces that shape the future. Since 1990, Michael Lindemann has earned national recognition for contribution uh, to the studies of UFOs. He first examined the UFO controversy in 1989 from the angle of its possible connection to covert weapons development and social policy, finding substantial evidence in support of UFO claims. He founded the Visitors Investigation Project to conduct and publish UFO research. Through the 2020 group, Michael Lindemann consults to the entertainment industry, news media, business community, independent researchers, and private individuals on all aspects of the UFO subject, as well as other issues impacting the present and future conditions of human society. He's a dynamic public speaker. He's uh, lectured and held seminars in just about every part of the United States, is a frequent guest on radio and TV of all sorts. So here from Santa Barbara, California, is Michael Lindemann. Michael, hi. Uh, let's see. Let's try it again. Michael, how are you doing? I'm fine. Good to hear from you, Art. Glad to have you back on the program. Uh, for a lot of my listeners, uh, Michael, uh, they will never have heard you since we're on so many uh, new affiliates. So I just guess I told them a little bit about you. What is the 2020 group and what are you doing now? Well, Art, uh, as you said a minute ago, the 2020 Group is basically a private research and publishing organization, which I founded in 1989. At the time um, I, I, w I founded the organization, I really wasn't that interested in the UFO subject. I had spent the previous entire decade of the 1980s primarily concerned with arms race issues, uh, the uh, uh, unprecedented military buildup here in this country, and the saber rattling between the U.S. and Soviets during the first part of the 80s was uh, of great concern to people all over the world, of course. And of course. Uh, that changed, obviously, very, very dramatically at the end of the decade, which meant that I was switching my focus, uh, looking around for what other kinds of subjects might actually, uh, in effect, drive the social process here in the United States as well as other parts of the world. I think it can safely be said that during the period uh, following World War II, right on up to the end of the 80s, the arms race, the, the so-called Cold War, was the single strongest influence upon social policy all over the world. Mm -hmm. The prospect we might go to nuclear war. All the ways of preventing that, all the ways of regulating that, all the ways of negotiating it for better or worse, and all of the technology and industry that went into that, that was the largest single thing in, our, in, in the whole social policy area. Now, of course, that has changed dramatically, and I was asking what's next. <clears throat> but at the same time, I was saying, why do we continue to build extremely arcane uh, new weapon systems? And uh, so I put that you know, question out to a bunch of people. And I said, okay, if there isn't, if the Soviet Union is no longer the big enemy, in fact, uh, at that time the Soviet Union was fast becoming a non-entity, um, if uh, there is no other entity of, uh, of that magnitude which could uh, threaten us, who then would be the, the rationale, the target, as it were, for all these new weapons? Uh, it, Michael, it's an awfully good question, uh, particularly in view of the fact that if you look at our current defense budget, while there are cuts... There's still a lot of money going into weapons uh, development, and uh, who, who are we fighting potentially? Exactly. Who are we fighting potentially is a very important question. Not only do we have a fairly lar very large defense budget out in the open art, the money that people all know about in the federal budget, but there is also, much more importantly even, the black budget, about which very few people know. Mm -hmm. And we may have uh, occasion to speak of that later in the, in, the, in, the, in the program, but I would like to mention to all of your listeners that if you have not yet heard or seen the book Blank Check by Timothy Weiner, I strongly recommend that you go out and get that book. It's in softcover. 
blank check uh, subtitled The Pentagon's Black Budget. By what, what about this uh, theory, if you don't mind, uh, yeah? Michael, that uh, old habits die hard. And I know that sounds laughable and silly, but we have a long tradition now of connection between the government and defense contractors and all the rest of it. Jobs are at stake. Uh, lots of things I can think of might drive, other than a real national security need, um, weapons development. You're quite right. There's no question. Part of it is momentum, Art. Part of it is momentum for the simple reason that these weapons development, uh, this, these weapons systems are on a very, very long development curve. And back when, for example, the alleged Aurora spy plane was, uh, it became a priority project, uh, back in those days, the, uh, the Soviet Union was a very much a formidable enemy. And the uh, idea of a new supersonic or uh, super high-speed hypersonic plane was a very good idea, or at least a feasible idea. Today, we have to say, maybe that plane ha is anachronistic, but I'm not so sure. And we should be in, uh, bear in mind, too, that uh, that plane officially does not exist, and yet all of the major aerospace uh, uh, book or magazines in the English language say it does. The U.S. Geological Survey says it does because they can track its movements on their on their uh, seismographs. Mm. Many uh, professional plane spotters say it does. This is a plane which officially doesn't exist. In fact, the Air Force has said vehemently time and again, not only have we not built it, we don't know how, so please, you know, leave us alone. Only a few weeks ago, uh, CIA director Director uh, Woolsey said at a, uh, at a at a university in Kansas, asked by someone in the audience, "What about the Aurora?" He said, "Not only does no nothing called the Aurora exist, nothing like that in concept exists." All right. Well, listen, we've got to hold it right there, Michael. Okay. We're at the bottom of the hour. Sit tight for about four minutes. We'll be right back to you. This is Dreamland on the CBC Network. You are listening. Take a listen. You'll get an earful. Talk Radio 102 FM. Come enjoy the big produce carnival of fruit savings at Thompson Food Basket in Morton. This is Kent Henderson, produce manager. Right now you'll find great savings on produce, like red or black California plums for just 69 cents a pound. Large California peaches are only 49 cents a pound. White or red seedless California grapes are 99 cents a pound. And first of the season, Talbot sweet corn is available too, with 10 ears for only $1.79. Shop and save every week and get double coupons up to 60 cents every day at Thompson Food Basket, 435 West Jackson in Morton. Now, here's the Poet Laureate of the Morton Community Bank, Cliff Hasselbacher. Summer is here and it's about time. How about a CD that's tied to prime? The flowers are blooming, that sure is great. Your hometown bank always gives a fair rate. If you like your banking without a frown, do your banking at MCB, not out of town. And this is Jean Ann Honiger. At MCB, we always offer competitive rates. And our friendly account representatives are ready to help you with your investment needs. It's another service of your hometown bank, the Morton Community Bank. Remember, FDIC. Flowers by Florence and Pekin does not have a special for you. That's right, no special. That's because at Flowers by Florence and Pekin, you can always buy a dozen roses for just $17.95. So for those not-so-special occasions, get a dozen roses for just $17.95 at Flowers by Florence. Call 347-4500 to get those roses for that special someone, no matter what the occasion. That's 347-4500 for Flowers by Florence. Fifth and Market Streets in Pekin. The number one key to success in all relationships is communication. We'll talk about communication on the new single and the issues that affect us. Join me, Janet Rudd, at 1130 every Saturday morning for a thought-provocative program. The new single, sponsored by Dates. With 48 marriages and 22 engagements, I'll share the secrets to success on the new single every Saturday morning at 1130 on Talk Radio 102 FM. Every weekend at Talk Radio Weekend. Keep it on Talk Radio 102. Every Saturday afternoon, be here for the Pet Patrol with Dr. Art Herm from the Morton Animal Hospital. Whether it's a seasonal pet problem, nutrition, pet care, whatever, you can bet you'll hear about it on the Pet Patrol every Saturday afternoon starting at noon here on Talk Radio 102 FM. Did you know?
show that babies need most of their shots by the time they are two years old. Without a full series of shots, babies are vulnerable to one or more dangerous diseases. If you don't have a doctor, call this toll-free hotline number. Sponsored by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the nearest address for shots. The number is 1-800-232-2522. That's 1-800-232-2522. A public service message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Ag Council, and Talk Radio 102 FM. It's Talk Radio 102 Central Illinois Spotlight. A look ahead at upcoming not-for-profit organization events or programs and services of community interest. Hi, I'm Evelyn Franklin. I'm with the Pluto Promenaders Square Dance Club. It's a group of energetic youth and adults that like to have good, clean, fun square dancing and doing country lines. You can join in that fun by taking square dance lessons starting Sunday, September 18th from 2 to 5 in the afternoon at the Masonic Hall at 700 South 4th Street in Morton. It's only $1 a person per week. The instructor is Novice Franklin. For more information, call Talk Radio 102 or the instructor at 266-9870. In Central Illinois, just listen for Central Illinois Spotlight from Talk Radio 102 FM. The unexplained, the unusual, the unknown. This is Dreamland on Talk Radio 102 FM. From the Kingdom of Nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. He heads up the 2020 group. His name is Michael Lindemann. And we're talking about, uh, at the moment, uh, things military, our defense budget. And he brings up an awfully good point. If the threat is largely, underlying that word, gone, then what are we doing? Spending billions and billions, it's a tip of the hat to Mr. Sagan, of dollars on new weapons systems. We were discussing the Aurora. Michael, you're back on the air. Okay, Art. Just complete that thought real quick. Yes, the, but the bottom line is the that the CIA director uh, says categorically it doesn't exist. Everybody else who knows anything says categorically that it does exist. That is to say, in the civilian sector, the military says flatly it doesn't exist. So you've got this divide here where they say it doesn't exist. Now, just as a, as a point of reference, we might note that in last week's New York Times, in the Sunday New York Times magazine, there was an article about Dreamland, uh, dear to your heart, I'm sure, uh, right up there at Area 51. Yes. And um, where the uh, the writer, uh, almost tongue-in-cheek, uh, pointed out that uh, although we've got loads of photos of the place and everyone and his brother knows it's up there, the military still will tell you flat out it doesn't exist, it isn't there. And this is, I think, something we have to understand, that these people lie for a living, and to them it isn't lies, it's policy. So we have to understand that whenever we're talking about uh, this subject, we're dealing with an area where deception is the rule of thumb. And is, it, Michael, is a lie to in the cause of national defense a lie or just national defense? Well, it is still a lie, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, but it is a lie with a rationale or a lie with an excuse, as it were. Ollie North trotted out his famous thing. We had to trade off, we had to trade off uh, whether, which was more important, lives or lies, lives with a B or lies, He, uh, in defense of his, of his uh, Iran-Contra behavior. Uh, Winston Churchill, when he was uh, plotting with uh, Stalin, and Roosevelt to uh, defeat Hitler said uh, in 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 uh, in the wartime uh, the truth is so important that she must be guarded with a bodyguard of lies. Right. Now this is this is the way policy is conducted, and I am not saying that it's always wrong. I am simply saying it is something we must understand. We must factor it in. I'm not pointing a moralistic finger at these people. I'm just saying facts are facts. Sure. These people lie for a living. Now when it comes to um, when it comes to the UFO subject, of course, uh, we're up against what is arguably the biggest secret in world history. Uh, and there, of course, I think, I think for all practical purposes, we, it is being conducted in a war mentality, though it is not necessarily a war issue. But it is certainly being conducted with a war mentality. And so we have to assume that this... Uh, 
uh, lies in defense of policy, lies as policy, is uh, very much the order of the day. Have you concluded, Michael, that we are being visited? Uh, my personal conclusion is absolutely yes. I believe I am, I am absolutely convinced. And what is the body of evidence that brought you to that conclusion? Well, it is, I must say, it has been coming together incrementally, Art. I wish I could point to a smoking gun. I really can't. I would like to say, however, that the new evidence or the recent accumulation of evidence around the Roswell incident is extremely compelling. And yes. we can now point to several excellent books on that subject, uh, one by Stanton Friedman called uh, Crash at Corona and two by Randall and Schmidt the first one called uh, UFO Crash at Roswell, and, and the new one this year called The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, which somewhat rewrites the timeline. But for all practical purposes, the story is the same and has been pretty much the same since Bill uh, 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 Moore first published uh, the Roswell incident back in 1980. But today we have, you know, dozens of first-hand eyewitnesses and many, many other eyewitnesses, family people who have seen how their loved ones passed away babbling about Roswell on the deathbeds, for example. We know know that something extraordinary happened at Roswell, and it has all the earmarks of the most well-documented, legitimate UFO crash recovery in history. Not the only one, but one which is virtually a lead pipe certainty. And here we are face to face with one instance that, that proves the, the argument, as it were. Now, if Roswell happened as we think it happened, then the, re the military is in possession of a substantial amount of uh, legitimate UFO wreckage, that is to say, machinery built by a non-human, technically advanced intelligence. And they are probably... Well, this made the... Rock 106. Disappeared, was shipped out under unusual circumstances and later disappeared, uh, never to be seen again. Uh, Glenn Dennis uh, says that he was told uh, also, um, if you speak a word of what you've seen or heard, uh, someone will be picking your bones out of the sand. Yeah, you know, uh, it's easy to sit back academically when you're listening to this and saying, well, then why didn't they just blow it all out and, you know, let the story out and go to the press and all the way? Well, that's a significant threat. If you've ever had one made like that, uh, you'll know if not, you cannot imagine to kill you and your family and your children is not a trivial threat. That is correct. There was a young girl uh, whose name at the moment escapes me, and perhaps I can dredge it up later on. Uh, her father was a fire uh, officer down there, and the fire department apparently had been called out to help uh, uh, set up the cordon around the crash area. Uh, some small pieces of wreckage uh, showed up at the fire department at a, uh, for a short period of time, and this young girl, 12 years old at the time, uh, Frankie, uh, uh, Frankie something, I forget her first. Uh, Frankie something, I forget her, for her last name. Um, it says today, she has recently been interviewed, that, that she was told, she was, uh, she was approached by military officers, and she, again, a 12-year-old child, no concept of secrecy, no idea what's going on, but she had seen a small piece of wreckage which behaved oddly. Um, uh, when it was bent, it came back into uh, its original shape without any creases. She found that fascinating. But she said that they, they said to her, you have never seen anything, you don't know anything. And she said, well, I, but I saw this thing. And they said, no, you didn't see that. She said, yes, I did. They said, you don't understand. We can take you out in the desert and you'll never be seen again. Uh, now, this was a 12-year-old child for crying out loud. So what we're seeing here is that if this has been treated as an issue of espionage, as an issue where there are no rules except the rule of expediency, mm -hmm. the rule of get the job done, whatever it takes. And I think we can say, in all honesty, whether we justify it or not, we have here cases of domestic terror, which was justified in the national interest. People have been told, shut up or die. And that tells us something about the seriousness of this issue. You wonder how they allow people like me on the air. Well, you know, I, the, you wonder how they... I, I ask the same question about myself, and I'll tell you why. All right. The fact is uh, that you have not broken any oaths. You, as far as I know anyway, have not seen anything with your own eyes. You are, as it were, a peddler of tall tales. And in a certain sense, so am I. Now, you know, please don't take that wrong. I think what you're doing is extremely important. Uh, I think it may help break the logjam. Maybe they, maybe they look at me and say, well, there's a guy helping to muddy the waters. There's a guy with a million stories on the radio and uh, people to sit back and say, oh, yeah, right. 
Exactly. And there's a real, there's a, there's a purpose to that. Now, I, I will throw out the proposition, which I'm sure we will be able to explore uh, this evening further, and that is that we are being desensitized. That there has been a strategy of what I call containment for going on now 47 years, uh, in which the principal uh, priority was, at all costs, keep the secret. Mm -hmm. What we see now, though, is that the containment is disintegrating. People are telling their stories on deathbeds. Deathbed testimony has a certain persuasiveness to it. Yes. We have dozens and dozens of witnesses who say, I refuse any longer. I, I have always kept my vows, my, my, my security vows, uh, and, and considered them very important. But now we have people saying, I'm sorry, this is more important. Yes. So, so, so dang those vows, I'm going to talk. We have, of course, um, hundreds of people saying that they are having these experiences, face-to-face -face experiences. We have, as Linda so eloquently reports, week after week, we have these extraordinary mutilations. And, and I, for one, uh, second Linda 100% when she says that when you add up the evidence and ask uh, who could possibly be doing this, it, it boils down to it looks an awful lot like it must be aliens. Uh, maybe we can get back to that. But the point here, is. Let me just stop you long enough to say, did you, uh, you know, her report tonight was particularly interesting. I could never make the connection with the helicopters because that would mean government. But her little story about frequencies monitored and units dispatched in areas of activity, all of a sudden that made some sense, Michael. Yes, I agree. I, um... It, the, the black helicopters or the incidents of unmarked helicopters around the mutilation events has always been one of the big puzzles. And, and I think it still is, but I think Linda's on the right track. Because it seems to me that uh, it, is, it is extremely improbable that we, that is to say our military uh, or our people, whoever they are, are conducting the mutilations per se. And yet I am quite sure they must be extremely interested perhaps even deeply concerned about this, and yes, they would be monitoring this. Yes. Now, there should be. If we understand anything at all about alien propulsion, it seems to me that one thing that we're aware of is that there are very, very strong and probably characteristic microwave signatures associated with low-level uh, UFO activity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of evidence that that's the case. Indeed, that may be directly involved in the creation of crop circles. That it remains to be proven, but it's a possibility. Um, in the case of uh, the mutilations, if indeed a UFO must come close to the ground for a period of time in order that this event be... be uh, perpetrated, as it were, it is possible that that very peculiar and powerful microwave signature would be uh, traceable. And indeed, uh, since we know that these events occur in concentrations, and quite often for reasons unknown, near major military bases. For example, the, the, the wave of things that have happened in northern Alabama happens to be rather close to the Huntsville area, which is an absolute military hotbed, of course, a major center for NASA as well. So we see, for, for again, reasons is unknown that this happens a lot in areas where it would be feasible for the black helicopters to be uh, to be uh, scrambled in short order and to go see what's going on. Wow. Um, so, so then uh, you believe they're here. You're probably like everybody else, not quite sure. Should I ask you about why? Why do you think they're here, Michael? What's your best guess? Well, I could only give you a uh, uh, a guess, as you say. Um, let me start by saying that I am slowly gravitating toward what I would have to say, and with all due respect to myself and others, uh, is the current lunatic fringe of serious UFO research, okay? Uh-huh. Now... Which is what? Which is the proposition that they've always been here, or they've been here one heck of a long time. Um, and... Let me let me back up on that a second and say that over time, the lunatic fringe of this research area has shifted a great deal. It was only about 15 years ago, Art, when the concept of abduction was right out at the lunatic fringe. Absolutely. And today, as we all know, abduction is the centerpiece issue of UFO research, and anyone, yes. even the very conservative organizations, such as the Center for UFO Studies in uh, in uh, Chicago, uh, uh, which you know by any stretch is a conservative. UFO uh, research group, uh, they're, they're, you know, 
they're on the uh, bandwagon with abduction. Um, today we have the most uh, astounding abduction tales being taken very seriously by Harvard professors and so forth. And so we have to say, well, this this uh, topic has come of age. By the way, John Mack's going to be a guest on the program uh, in the next few weeks. Very good. Very good. Well, of course, as we probably know, most of your listeners, I hope, are aware of John Mack's uh, quite remarkable new book. I would like to say a word about that in a minute, but let me just finish this other thought. Sure. Um, We've seen that line, the lunatic fringe line, as it were, change, shift over time. Now, way back in the 60s, a guy named Eric von Donneken said, you know, he thinks that the so-called ancient astronauts have been here forever and, and maybe left traces of their passing, you know, centuries or millennia ago. And in a certain sense, von Donneken, um, that caused it was his own biggest uh, problem because he, his research was sloppy. He made lots of mistakes in his basic statements and so forth. But it's quite possible that he was on to something very, very important. And in the meantime, uh, we've seen uh, better scholarship out of people like Zechariah Sitchin. And we are finding that one of the most prominent themes among abductees today is this theme they are being told time and time again, instructed about the ancient history of the world and how it is that we have had this long-running relationship with with these others. Now, uh, we should say, too, that these others do not appear to be a single group. There seem to have been, this may have been a crossroads, you know, for this part of the galaxy, for sure. all we know. We hear stories to the effect that this is a fascinating planet because it is replete with so many different life forms that, that, that this is somewhat of an anomaly in that respect. Well, I don't know if any of that is true. It's an interesting idea. The, the, idea, the, the fact is, however, that there are all over the world incidences of what we, rec- what we call out-of-place artifacts and then also art- out-of-place knowledge. For example, why is it that the Sumerians five or 6,000 years ago knew the precise um, dimensions and, and uh, uh, structure of the solar system. This is something that we didn't know. We didn't know about the planet Pluto, for example, until 1930. We didn't know about Uranus and Neptune until the uh, latter part of the 19th century. And yet the Sumerians knew these planets. They knew their size. They knew their color. They knew how long it took for these planets to go around the sun. This is a fascinating fact. They wrote it all down, so we know it's true. They even had diagrams. Michael, uh, it argues two possibilities, uh, really, it seems to me. One, that we were visited long ago and given these technologies, or two, and I have a number of guests that have said this recently, that it's possible that there are periodic polar shifts and that man on, uh, on this planet comes and goes and that there may have been prior civilizations. Okay. Prior civilizations, yes. Even possibly prior periods of exceedingly high technology. Indeed, uh, the new information about the Sphinx is most provocative in that regard. Are you familiar with the latest information concerning the possible age of the Sphinx? Please tell me. Well, a man named John Anthony West, a couple of years ago, noted something most peculiar about the Sphinx. He was looking at photographs of the Sphinx, and he said, by golly, this thing was eroded with water, not wind. Now, this is this is makes it an anomaly in the whole area. All the other structures around there, the giant pyramids of Giza and so forth, are all very clearly wind eroded, but water erosion looks very, very different. And there's simply no doubt at all, from the standpoint of a geologist, that the Sphinx is eroded with water, the back part of it. So the question is, how is it possible that the Sphinx could have been eroded with water? When did it rain in Egypt? And the bottom line there is it didn't rain, it hasn't rained any, in any significant amount in Egypt for 10,000 years. Now, this of course raises a firestorm with Egyptologists because they have nailed down the age of the Sphinx who built it, what it's for, and all of that. But nonetheless, the geologists have come on board like gangbusters because John Anthony West, who's no geologist at all, enlisted the aid of some geologists from various universities in the East and the East Coast, and they went out there very grudgingly at first, but they had a look and they said, by golly, this guy is absolutely right. This bloody monument is eroded with water, and there's some, and it's very apparent. It's not an ambiguous matter. So now, every geologist that has a look at it just, you know, drops his jaw to the floor and says, this is, this is the most fantastic thing we've ever seen. Bottom line, what does it mean? The Sphinx can't be 5,000 or 4,000 years old, like people say. It can't be an artifact of that dynasty that everyone pins it on. It is something that was built 10 or 12,000 years ago, long enough ago, Art, that rain, substantial amounts of rain, could have substantially eroded it before the rain stopped. And that is an absolutely stunning 
change in our whole view of that area. It is. Michael, hold on just one moment. My guest, Michael Lindemann. Uh, the Sea Crane Company sells the DL telephone. What is what is the DL telephone? Why should you want it? <laughs> Oh, these are easy answers. The DL telephone, uh, in, ter in, in, in the area of what is it, it's a digital telephone. That means that it breaks your caller's voice down and your voice down into true individual digital yeses and nos. <laughs> confusing uh, it reassembles them on the other end so what does that mean well here's here's what it means here's how it works um, it is as good as a plug into the wall telephone it's a portable telephone operates on 900 megahertz up above the cellular area it uh, it is so clear that you will not be able to detect any difference between it and a telephone you plug into the wall no difference in terms of either the caller's voice or yours going back. Can you imagine that? Can you believe it? Believe it. It's true. I have uh, a couple of them, as a matter of fact. I love this telephone. What else does it do? It gives you complete privacy. Because it is digital, nobody can monitor it on a scanner. Nobody. Matter of fact, it doesn't even have the clipper chip in it yet. It's, uh, it's complete privacy. Three. My telephone will go three quarters of a mile. I can go to neighbors' homes and all the rest of it. I've got good geography here for that, I'll uh, grant you. And if you have a lot of buildings, it may lessen somewhat. But uh, almost everybody I've talked to uh, gets between, uh, gets right on up to a half mile or better. Imagine that. So you can take it to neighbors' homes, that sort of thing. It's got all the features you would expect and demand of a portable telephone. The redials, the flashes, the holds, all the rest of that sort of thing. In fact, the DX model even has a, a very, very effective intercom in it. Now, the DL telephone is one ninety nine. 95 and um, there are only a few more in stock so get on the telephone tuesday morning not monday because they're closed monday but tuesday morning with the sea crane company at 1-800-522-8863 then by the way when you get it take your old telephone and throw it as far as you can throw it <laughs> no interference from others uh, using it uh, also by the way that number again to order, 1-800-522-8863. Back to Michael Lindemann. Michael. Yes, sir. Um, so then what do you think is the most likely, that uh, we were visited or that there was another civilization or there have been many civilizations or that there has simply been a rise and a decline back to the cave days? or What, what do you think happened? What I think, first of all, Art, is that we currently live in an extremely narrow worldview about our history, about our past. We have some giant surprises ahead of us in terms of understanding our past. Probably high civilization goes back a lot further than we think in certain places. But even so, it would appear that these high civilizations arose um, rather inexplicably, at least according to our current understanding current understanding of how civilizations arise and how they flourish and how they pass their knowledge to succeeding civilizations. I am currently of the opinion, and am desperately groping for data, I might add, huh. um, that probably there have been infusions of information from off-world sources or from sources that we would not call human, uh, that this has probably happened periodically over time, and uh, that that would account in some cases for the sudden appearance of extraordinary civilizations in places that were not supportive of civilization prior. All right, why then would that knowledge uh, not have contributed to a general rise uh, rather than the possibility of uh, there having been a, a, a highly technical civilization previously? Well, you know, in some cases it did contribute to a general rise. For example, uh, we really trace uh, a lot of what we call modern civilization today all the way back to Sumeria. If Sumeria 
uh, was a uh, one of the seed beds of uh, this round, let us say, of uh, civilization and technology. An enormous amount of that has been passed down, uh, virtually unchanged, through the Babylonians and Assyrians, and shared with the Egyptians, and may even have filtered eastward toward the Vedic cultures, and certainly uh, became the basis for uh, the cultures of the Middle East, and from there on to um, uh, uh, the Minoan culture, the Greek culture, and the Roman culture, and from there, of course, in a straight line to us. Uh, there is no question that there has been a long path of more or less unbroken uh, handing down. But the question is, where in, uh, you know, the devil did, did the Sumerians get their fantastic knowledge of astronomy, of agriculture, including irrigation, right. their codes of law, their codes of philosophy, their codes of their, their All right, Michael, we've got to hold it there. We're at the top of the hour. Relax for about six minutes. We'll be right back to you. This is CBC. Sorry, but due to satellite transmission problems, Talk Radio 102 FM presents a previously recorded Art Bell Dreamland program. From the Kingdom of Nine, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am. Michael Lindemann is my guest. He's from the 2020 group which is an organization that looks at current trends and predict, uh, predicts uh, uh, future probabilities. I guess that would be a, w a good way to put it. We're talking about the, uh, the UFO phenomenon, uh, the visitations we're having, and uh, according to Michael, may have had for a very, very long time. And we're going back to it right now. We will begin to take calls shortly. Uh, Michael, a couple of things that I want to cover with you. Uh, you have a current project going on. Um, what was it? You told me about it, and uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I forgot. Um, are you referring to the, to the uh, computer project? No, 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 no. Uh, just previous to that, you had mentioned a project by name. I had mentioned a project by name. Um, yes, you have. You've stopped me. <laughs> Are you writing something currently, or... Um... Oh, uh, no, you and I, I was talking about coming of age in the cosmic neighborhood. That's right. There we go. I'm sorry. I, you, 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 uh, you got me a little bit confused there. Coming of age in the cosmic neighborhood is actually the name of a, of, of a lecture uh, that I am uh, going to be giving in several places around the Southwest uh, during the month of July. All right. Where are you going to be, and what is it all about? Okay, I'm going to be, uh, first of all, I'll be going to the uh, MUFON, uh, International MUFON Conference, uh, July 8, 9, and 10. Uh, for those of uh, people down in the Texas area that may want to go to the, uh, that'll be at the uh, uh, Hyatt Regency in Austin, Texas, uh, okay. July 8, 9, and 10. I'll be speaking down there. And then I'll be speaking in Albuquerque, New Mexico on uh, the uh, evening of, of Thursday, July 14th, and I'll be speaking in Scottsdale, Arizona. Arizona, right outside of uh, Phoenix, on Saturday, July 16th, uh, in both Albuquerque and Scottsdale, I'll be delivering a lecture uh, with lots and lots of slides and illustrations called Coming of Age in the Cosmic Neighborhood. And um, the, uh, the catchy little uh, punchline to that is, we are not alone, we are finding out, and that changes everything. Uh, so I, I, um, I'm trying to take a, a, a relatively upbeat uh, attitude toward this. We're facing a huge mystery. We're definitely facing a political dilemma. 
to say the least. Mm. Um, I think there are people inside the government who have taken this as one of the most serious challenges to the social order that they have ever had to deal with. It is very much on a par with serious warfare. But that does not mean we are necessarily facing hostility. What we are facing is high strangeness. We are facing the unexpected. We are facing the infusion of influences that we are not ready for. And that can be problematic, but not necessarily a disaster in the end. We have to get ready for this. We have to grow up and face the music. I think that is a huge challenge. I think it's exciting, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. All right. If uh, Here's a what if, Michael, um, and I'm curious how you would answer it. If I came to you, and I was from the government, and I said, look, most of what you've talked about, uh, well, some of it, you know, you're off, uh, you don't have it quite right. But the fact of the matter is, we are being visited. We've been uh, visited for a very, very long time. Uh, the Clinton administration has decided that uh, it wants to break word to the American public. You, Michael Lindemann, have studied this sort of thing. What do you recommend to us? What exactly would you tell them? I would tell them a couple of things. First of all, I would say that a, the process of desensitization is probably a sound political strategy, and I do believe that they're pursuing that. I don't believe that was a Clinton strategy. I believe it's been in place for several administrations at least. Um, but I would say, uh, yes, we must start telling people um, that the things have been going on. And I believe we should start with some of the old cases. We should start to acknowledge that we have not, that we have solid information uh, showing the fact that we have been visited. Um, this is going to be a hard pill to swallow for some people, but it's interesting that it may be less of a challenge than some people have predicted. Well, well after all, Michael, we did swallow the plutonium pill. Yes, <laughs> that deplorable pill. Mm. Quite, quite. Too, it's true, and it may just be that people are so kind of, you know, kind of uh, uh, just generally overwhelmed with the, with the rigors of daily life that they're kind of going to yawn and go, oh, yeah, right, aliens, no problem. Uh, <laughs> I uh, don't think so. Now, of course, it's been, um, it, there has been a running supposition in government, and we know this from uh, looking at the, um, uh, the uh, Robertson Panel Report from 1953, the CIA report about uh, debunking uh, the Brookings Institute reports that came out of the late 50s and early 60s, uh, reports from NASA and so forth, telling us unequivocally that the government has assumed that there would be some kind of, of very unpredictable social disorder if they simply said, well, by, you know, by the way, we've got aliens and we can't catch them and we don't know who they are or what they want, thought you'd want to know, uh, that that would probably precipitate a disaster which they were unwilling to take a risk on. I understand that. I think they're probably right. But I think, too, we're very different people today than we were then. I think that we're, we now have a, a generation of adults who grew up with the space age. We have a, gen a generation of adults who grew up with uh, fantastic space movies, who've seen all kinds of stuff on Star Trek since it began back in the late 60s. All this kind of thing has changed the picture enormously. We also have a huge amount of information coming out and reported much more respectfully today than ever before, though there have been waves in the past of good reporting and big stories. Today, it's really unprecedented. The number of books, the number of quality television programs, the number of reports in the news, uh, newspapers and magazines, all this is changing the picture a tremendous amount. It is. Still, the government is not likely to tell us about something that itself, uh, that the government itself does not fully understand. Uh, it's not likely, is it? No, it is not. It is not likely at all. But I do think that if ever there was an opportunity, the Clinton administration represents a major break from the past in a, uh, in a way that the, the Bush administration certainly did not. Bush, Bush's political roots go way back to the early 50s when he was involved with the with the CIA as a co in covert ops and, of course, as CIA director in the mid-70s. Yes. Uh, Reagan, of course, an, uh, an old guard guy, and then from there on all the way back through Nixon and, and, and those people. Uh, really, the last time we had a chance like this was the Jimmy Carter administration, and of course Jimmy Carter said in 1976 that he would tell everything, and so we find out there uh, that was a campaign promise. We find out there that when he got into office, something dissuaded him because he made it very plain in his campaign uh, uh, talks that he would tell. Why? Because he'd had a sighting and he believes in UFOs. So that changed when he got into office, and we have reason to believe that he, like other presidents, was briefed and told, I'm sorry, Mr. President, mm. you really don't understand the nature of the situation. It's well under control, but you're not in charge of this one, sir. You'll just have to go with the program. And I really think that that is the way it has been. But
But now, in a way that we haven't seen before, I do believe that the Clinton administration is positioned it could take this on because, in a very real sense, it had nothing to do with it. These people are a new, a new breed, and they can say, look, this is, we didn't make this problem, and we want to handle it differently than it's been handled before because we think the American people deserve the truth, and we think the American people can rise to the occasion. And, indeed, the other side of the coin is that millions of Americans know this is real because it's disrupting their lives, because they are having the experiences, and they know they're being lied to by the officials because they have grays in their living room. And yeah. Bedroom for yes. out loud. They are worried about why their kids are getting abducted, and they want the government to say something. <laughs> These people aren't going to be surprised. They're going to be relieved that someone's finally telling them the truth. So I think we're in a very interesting time, a very pregnant time. It is still politically risky, but it is not impossible to start talking about this, and I hope we do. When do you think uh, we might give birth? Oh, well, our, as you've already said, and I must agree with you, sad as it is, I don't believe that we're going to see the political guts uh, out of this administration. I think this administration's got a lot of problems, uh, you know, very, you know, <laughs> bottom line issues like whitewater, you know, really big, important stuff. Yeah. Uh, and and, and um, Paula, what's her name? Who, uh, Paula Jones. Paula Jones, Paula Jones yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, really important issues that are uh, clearly of a, a, a world-shaking magnitude. These things are going to uh, dissuade the, pop, uh, the uh, president, I think, from having the political guts to do anything of the kind we're talking about, but that doesn't make it impossible. I think there are other ways to go about it. Well, I don't know, uh, Michael. On the other hand, uh, I could imagine he would look at it this way. Fed up with Whitewater and Paula Jones, an announcement about aliens would tend to sort of make everything else... Pale and insignificant? Mm. You may be right. That's an interesting strategy. Now, here's, here's something happening. Uh, last time I was on your show, um, I made mention of the fact that there's this thing called the Roswell Declaration. Yes. And since you've got a bunch of new affiliates now, I want to say it again, because the, the deal is still the way it was. And by the way, the last time I was on your show, Art, I got 200 responses wow. in the mail. And that, I think, is a tribute to you and your show. Thank I, you. Fan, it was absolutely fantastic. But here's the thing. There is a, there's a, a, a piece of paper called the Roswell Declaration. It is now being widely circulated around the country and in Europe. And we have just learned, I'm happy to say, that it will soon appear as a full page page uh, spread in Omni magazine, wow. uh, which, will, of course, will present it to millions of people. What but is it? The Roswell Declaration is basically a, uh, a, a plea to the uh, Clinton administration to release information about some of the great classic UFO cases, principally uh, Roswell, but also some of the other cases, to declassify certain information that is that would be in the in, in the public interest to come clean on this information and let people know what really happened. How do people get a copy of it? All they have to do is send me a self a self addressed stamped envelope. Uh, send it to Michael Lindemann at three four six three State Street, Box two six four. Santa Barbara, California, 93105. I'll give that address again in a minute. But if you'll just send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, I will send back to you immediately the Roswell Declaration. It's self-explanatory. Read it, sign it, maybe maybe make copies of it first for your friends, and send it into the address that is listed on the declaration. And you will be joining tens of thousands of people, all of this being collected now, and after Omni presents it, and after it's presented in a few other major uh, news venues, it will all then be collated and sent as a single huge petition to the administration. It will who's, be sent to the president. Yeah, okay, who's doing this, uh, Michael? Who's behind it? Well, uh, it began with, a, with the initiative of a single individual named Kent Jeffrey, and this man really deserves a huge round of applause because he took this on by himself. He wrote the declaration by himself with, with the help of other people, but it including uh, the Mutual UFO Network, uh, the Center for UFO Studies, and the Front for UFO Research. They are now all co-signers of the declaration. Co this is this is really a good idea. Now, give the address again, please. Please uh, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Michael Lindemann at 3463 State Street, Box 264, Santa Barbara, California, 93105. And I will send you a declaration in the same day's mail.
All right, and when they're done with it, where do they send it? Do they send it back to you? No, there is an address listed. In fact, they can send it either to the Mutual UFO Network or to the Center for UFO Studies. Those addresses are listed on the declaration. Well, you know what, Michael? It just might be true that if enough of these were signed and sent in, and it were actually in the hundreds of thousands or hopefully millions, that this administration might take note and actually use it as a reason to make an announcement. It is possible, and it's very timely, too, that there's going to be a, a, an absolutely first-rate movie about Roswell on the Showtime Network on Sunday, July 31st. Now, I'm, oh. I, I'm sad to say that that may cut a little bit into your audience, Art, because it's going to be broadcast, I think, <laughs> during your show. That's a good but, <laughs> but, I, but I would like to say, not wanting to take one listener away from your show, this is a program, if you're, if you're going to be listening to Art Bell that night, then by golly, have your VCR running and... Right. Get this thing on tape and watch it, because I have seen it. I have already seen oh, an advanced seen copy of it, and I can tell you this is one fine movie. And it is a, it is, it is a, you might say it's a fictionalized docudrama. What is the name of it? It's called Roswell. Roswell. And it tells the story, and it is gripping. It has some name stars. Uh, Kyle McLaughlin is in the role of Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer out of Roswell who first broke the story in 1977. It has uh, Martin Sheen is in it, and some other well-known actors and actresses are in the program. It's first rate. It was, it was a big budget production for Showtime, and they have they are they've stayed true to the facts, even though it is it is you know classified as fiction the story is true that and really it, it really then ought to give uh, put some oomph behind the roswell declaration eh well we surely hope so and now it would appear though there isn't a deal cut yet it now appears that there may be some announcement concerning the roswell declaration in conjunction with showtime oh, wow uh, and we hope that happens showtime seems to be uh, uh, taking well to that suggestion, it's in negotiation or something. They certainly, I can't imagine that they have anything to lose by that. Oh, Michael, that's very exciting. All right, hold on just a moment. We'll come right back to you, Michael. That really is very exciting. Uh, Michael Lindemann uh, of the 2020 group in just a moment. Important enough, I'm going to repeat this address. All you need do is send a self-addressed stamped envelope. No money, just a self-addressed stamped envelope um, to Michael Lindemann. That's L-I-N-D, uh, L-I-N-D-E-R-M-A-N. Boy, I hope, is, or are there two, are there two, are there two N's in that? It's, it's L-I-N-D-E-M-A-N-N. -N. There's no R in there. Oh, thank you. L-I-N-D-E-M-A-N-N. -N. Okay, thank but anything, you. Any, any, anything close will do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, 3463 State Street, uh, Box 264. 264 Santa Barbara, California, right? And the zip code? 93105. 93105. I'm getting all this because I know they'll ask for it. All right. Michael, I would like to begin to take a few telephone calls. Are you up for it? You bet. All right. Let's do it. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hi. Hello. This is Fitz from Phoenix. Fitz from Phoenix. In Gentlemen, Canada. the questions come up constantly. Why are they here? What, why, what's the reason why they are so many studies over the 46, 47 years? Obviously, it's the cosmic connection. Now, Michael, you have nothing to lose. You have no credentials to use. You have a good reputation. Uh, but I must say this, if you, the UFO community actually has no leadership, there's no guidance, no coordination, no clearinghouse. In short, it's taking around like the four-plant uh, man and the elephant. Now, the ETs over the last 40 years have used various brands of conditioning processes, but mankind keeps refusing the calling cards. All right, the media uh, is to blame. Fritz, I want you to listen carefully on the air because this is, and it, I promise this is not a set up. Michael, he mentioned a clearinghouse. There's no leadership. There's no clearinghouse. There's no central point. <laughs> Wasn't a setup, Michael. Um, we, uh, you know, I made a, 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 a comment about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And we talked about it before the program. Yes. And I know that you can't tell us too much about it, but whatever you can tell us, tell us what's going on. Well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Fritz, uh, I'm very cognizant of the problem that you that you said. I agree with it. Um, I and a number of other uh, key uh, people in the field, in fact, people who are really quite uh, senior to myself in terms of their contributions to UFO research, are currently in discussion 
uh, about establishing some kind of a an ongoing forum on a major uh, online computer carrier uh, that would allow people to who are online, people who have computers, to participate in an ongoing way with high-level, high-quality discussions with top researchers, and those researchers would be able to discuss amongst themselves in forums which are which which can be broadcast publicly over the uh, network, over the computer network, and then rebroadcast again in print or in other forms of, of uh, secondary um, uh, broadcast formats. Um, but the point would be that we would begin to have a, an, a concentrated uh, online um, uh, information sharing, information synthesizing process. Mm -hmm. Now, this project has been in development for more than six months. Uh, it is still uh, not ready for public disclosure. I have to be rather reticent about it, uh, and and we are not at all ready to start, uh, you know, telling people how to subscribe. But I will say this: I am now, after recent developments, I am now confident that this project is going to come to fruition. That that it will involve a more or less uh, astounding array of high quality researchers when it comes online. And I'm very happy to have played a role in, in causing this thing to occur. And I would love to tell all your, your listeners right now how they can just sign up and do it. Well, uh, since you... I, since, maybe next time. Yeah, <laughs> since you cannot, that was going to be my question. The moment you can, will you come back on the program? I and sure will. I would be delighted. It's very exciting. It's about time, and uh, I don't know what else to say other than that. It's about time. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with L Michael Lindemann. Hello. Good evening. Uh, this is Bill from Vancouver. Hi, Bill. KEX and KVI. I'm lucky. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Lindemann, I have a question for you. Um, could you briefly tell me what is, since you know so much about weapons, what is this red mercury? And also, would either one of you be interested in receiving photos from the newspapers, not only the Oregonian, but there are several community newspapers of Forest Grove in of the um, of the the field, the circle. Oh now. yes, absolutely. Okay. I would very much. I would like to receive anything you've got on the crop circle activity up there. I would be very grateful. Did you get my my? Yeah. Can I put that in with uh, when I send for oh, the you sure can. I'd be delighted. Thanks so much. Okay. And Mr. Bell, could you please also say your PO box number on the air? All right. I'll and, give I'll give my address out. Uh, Michael, we've only got just a very uh, few seconds before the break. Red Mercury, do you know what that is? Frankly, I, I, I hate to sound stupid, but I don't know about Red Mercury. Sorry, <laughs> caller. <laughs> well, that's all right. Um, Michael, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, so what I would like you to do is just sort of hold on for a moment. Uh, we'll both look forward to those... Um, uh, uh, to those uh, clippings. I certainly will. By the way, my address is Art Bell. Post Office Box 4755. Post Office Box 4755. Pahrump. P-A-H-R-U-M-P. Pahrump, Nevada. Don't laugh. Zip code 89041-4755. You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. For Central Illinois, this is Talk Radio 102. To FM. From the kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 TALK. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 727 1295. 727 1295. In the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am. Michael Lineman is my guest. Lots of news breaking this morning on this program and uh, a lot of it very welcome don't forget the uh, the Roswell declaration send a self-addressed stamped envelope please to Michael Lindemann L-I-N-D-E-M-A-N-N -N, uh, 3463 State Street box 264 Santa Barbara California zip code 93105 93105 Oh, five. And
and uh, back now to Michael Lindman and your calls. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Are you ready for more? Yes, I am. I want to make a quick comment before you pick up the phone there. Uh, the gentleman who called about Red Mercury, I, uh, one of my uh, uh, friends was standing by here listening to the program and, and, and said, uh, don't you remember about the, the Red Mercury business that was uh, basically has to do with the possible proliferation of illicit nuclear materials out of the former uh, Soviet Union or the satellite Soviet states. Oh. Um, and uh, I can't honestly, I, I really can't satisfy the caller's inquiry directly because I really have to confess ignorance as to the, the real details of the Red Mercury problem. But I will say, generally speaking, that we have to be very careful when we, when we uh, congratulate ourselves on getting past the Cold War. We're not anywhere near out of the woods yet, and I think this is really what the Red Mercury scare is about, that there is a great deal of illicit nuclear material floating around, a lot of it missing from, from the former Soviet states, and even a lot of it missing from our own nuclear situation. And, of course, one of the big scares today is that nuclear material can get into the hands of terrorism. The, the single most likely way that we would still have uh, um, nuclear detonations on this planet of a, of a war of a war type would be in the hands of terrorists. And on that, while we're on that subject, Michael, uh, there's a little more breaking news. Uh, tomorrow morning, there is a historic and perhaps even troubling first. The FBI opens their office in Moscow tomorrow morning. And uh, they do it ostensibly to um, help with Russia's terrible crime problem and uh, to investigate, I believe, the connection between the Russian mafia and uh, uh, the possibility of uh, their getting hold of some nuclear weapons. Were you aware of that, Michael? Well, to be honest with you, I was not aware of the nuclear weapons issue, but I will say this. Um, it is a, uh, a truism uh, in today's world that um, s small, easily portable nuclear weapons would be probably the most valuable black market item imaginable, and that there are arsenals of such weapons in the former Soviet states which have not been guarded up to our Standards. specs, okay? Mm -hmm. And yes, the FBI is interested in this. We might even say desperately interested in this. And yes, our own intelligence agencies. And indeed, I think, in fairness, the governments of the, of the former Soviet states are extremely concerned about this, but that the concern alone may not stem the, stem the flood. Uh, uh, there's, there's something I missed here, Michael. I thought the FBI was a domestic agency. If I'm not mistaken, what we have here, Art, is a is is something on the order of a um, an advisory uh, uh, office. I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that, but you're right. The FBI is, und is undoubtedly a, a, a domestic agency. But then again, you know, these agencies cross the line. The CIA will tell you every single time. You said, do you do any 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 uh, you know in country? Absolutely uh, not. <laughs> well, I should right. say not. But you know, that's a pile of baloney. So um, the fact is. These agencies go where they need to go, and they really aren't well, governed that, that powerfully by uh, any code of all law. All right, just before we leave the subject, what about Korea? It's big news. They're building nuclear weapons, uh, probably already have them. Jimmy Carter just came back with almost a piece in our time flap of the paper, and uh, now it looks as though the crisis is kind of on the back shelf again. Is it really, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter came back and said the crisis is over. Mm -hmm. Um, is it really over, Michael? Well, I, of course, I'm not sure, but I will say this. I don't believe that any legitimate state has anything to gain um, by threatening to use nuclear weapons. Many states want to possess nuclear weapons as a hedge against their own social disorder. North Korea is one of the final bastions of old-line communism. As such, they are absolutely anachronistic, and um, uh, the Pyongyang uh, administration is looking at the prospect of a total social disaster if they lose their grip on the people. Right. It is a very good idea from their point of view to have 
have weapons, but not to use them. No legitimate state can afford to use weapons, not even one. Only The only real use for those weapons today is going to be in the hands of terrorists. And, of course, that will in event, eventually lead to nothing as well, but, of course, could cause an awful lot of commotion along the way. But I think that's where the threat of the weapons comes from, is that these states need them to buttress their own legitimacy with their own people. And in that respect, no, the crisis is not over because Korea, North Korea, is on the verge of a social catastrophe. Right. In other words, are they actually giving up the idea of nuclear weapons, ready to negotiate them away, or are they just stalling for time while the uh, the fuel rods they have cool? They cannot yet extract uh, plutonium, from, uh, plutonium uh, from them, and surely the one thing they needed was time. Is that what Jimmy Carter and this administration have now given them time not necessarily yeah, they may have given them time yes but but what is more important what what north korea needs more than time is legitimacy north korea needs to feel that it is not the odd man out in a world ringed by enemies um, uh, and if north korea can be made to feel, if, for example, there is a genuine detente between North and South Korea, if North Korea is welcomed into the fold of economically developing countries in the Far East, then we may see a possibility where the North Koreans do not feel the need to develop nuclear weapons in the way they have felt. And I would call that a step in the right direction. I can't guarantee it'll happen, but I think that that is where the negotiations are headed. All right. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hi. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Yes, ma'am. You're on the air. Turn your radio off and tell us where you're calling from. Um, Turn your radio off. Hawthorne, Nevada. Hawthorne. Okay, go ahead. Well, I just for, <laughs> I just heard these numbers, this <laughs> phone number, and I finally decided to call. Um, I just have one thing I'd like to know, and that is... Why do we have to go through, uh, the first time you make a phone call, why do you have to go through this process? I, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding what you mean. Well, the, the first time call... Hey, Ma'am, we have this number to make it easier for people who are trying to get through the first time. I see. I, I would just, okay, do you, have, do you have a question? Not really. Not tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Apparently just wanted to see if she could get through on the wild card line. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hi. Michael. Yes. Calling from Portland. Uh, you were in town last week. Yes, I was. And that was a, a great uh, lecture you gave with Randall and Schmidt. Thank you. I've promoted your book quite a bit, Six Viewpoints. So I consider it a uh, quintessential book, with, uh, along with uh, Linda Howe's new book, Glimpses of Other Realities. I'm, I'm flattered that you would compare my book with hers. Hers is magnificent. Now, Michael, a few years ago, you made a prediction that as ET information became analyzed, it would appear that the human race started independently around the globe. It seems like you've been vindicated. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what, you, what you're saying. Try, try that question again. Uh, you made a, a prediction a couple years ago that as uh, a lot of this information became analyzed, yeah, yeah, that it would be uh, believed that the human race evolved around the globe, not just in the one place as, as is commonly believed, but throughout the planet. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Okay, I see what you're getting at. And uh, information in certain science magazines kind of vindicates you that this indeed has uh, come true. Well, it, that, thank you. That's actually a rather subtle point, and I, and I thank you for bringing it up. Um, actually, uh, the argument is far from one. It's an extremely complicated situation. He's referring, Art, to some recent articles in, in uh, Science and Nature and some other more arcane magazines from the latest research on the evolution from the species we call uh, Homo erectus to the species we call Homo sapiens, and where, indeed, Homo erectus showed up around the planet, and whether or not Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens in one location or in several different locations, which seems rather less probable. And yet there is some information suggesting that Homo erectus actually migrated to various parts of the world out of Africa much earlier than previously thought, and at 
that stage was able then in all these independent locations eventually to show up as homo sapiens which would be an extraordinary thing to occur well it would because it would make the probability of life uh, elsewhere um a greater would it not um, uh, in other words are, let me get it straight are you saying that it came from one central locations mig uh, and migrated to other locations or that it developed uh, along simultaneous lines at several points uh, well it's actually both of what you said but here's the thing there has long been a theory that our species evolved in africa and then migrated to many parts of the world, yes. or that there were successive waves of migration, so that, for example, Homo erectus, a, a predecessor of ours, evolved in Africa and then moved out into various parts of the world, showed up in China, showed up in the steppes of Russia, and so forth. Uh, and then the theory, the old theory continues that uh, the Homo erectus continued to evolve in Africa until it achieved the status of Homo sapien, and then Homo sapien moved out of Africa into other places, and eventually, when it showed up in China, when it showed up in the steppes of, of Russia and Western Europe and so forth, just killed off the native population of Homo erectus. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Uh, new information suggests that Homo sapiens showed up in places like China much earlier than we thought, giving rise to the possibility that it evolved there. And mm. that um, is a whole new ball of, ball of wax. That's very exciting. Huh? Um, yeah, and what, what it says is that, that, that we, first of all, we really don't understand the evolutionary curve that led to our species. It would appear, for example, that Homo sapiens came on the scene rather suddenly, earlier than we thought, and without what we normally would call enough time to get to our very advanced, say if you want to call us advanced, but we're certainly advanced over Homo erectus. The question is, how did that jump occur? Now, there are people who say it occurred not as a natural consequence of evolution here on this planet, but as a as a, 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 a process that was pushed by the intrusion of alien uh, geneticists, if you will, genetic science from off-world. Now, that, again, I come back to this concept. We're talking now. We're way out on the lunatic fringe of you of our research. I admit that. I think that we have very little evidence in support of this, but at the same time, we have huge conundrums that have no easy answer. Is it possible that Homo sapiens is, at least in part, the product of genetic engineering? And the answer there is, well, doggone it, just maybe the answer is yes. And we have to take that seriously. Now, for example, we go back to the Sumerians, as I talked earlier. I'll tell you something, Michael. A hundred years ago, we'd have burned you for that. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> And, you know, 100 years from now, well, they might burn us for that. They might. We uh, are facing a very, there, there's a very serious religious challenge here, Art. All right, there are also a million calls, Michael. We've got to get to them on the wild card line. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hi. Yes, uh, KFBR Fairbanks. Fairbanks, Alaska. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm wondering if maybe the Sphinx that uh, he wrote it during the Great Flood of Noah's Day, and if maybe or not the... Uh, the people are being prepared for what the Bible calls a strong delusion, where when the Christians are raptured, perhaps people will be told that UFOs took them. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Want to tackle that one, Michael? Well, I will say this. Um, not only the Christian uh, religious tradition, but other religious traditions around the world point to this time, or a time very near this time, as a time of tremendous upheaval and tremendous change. It is one of the great curiosities of prophecy from around the world yes. that this is a time that the prophets pointed to. And uh, it is possible to interpret the rapture that is described in, uh, in uh, the John's Revelation as uh, possibly an alien event or a UFO event. Now, I realize the Christians don't want to interpret it that way. This is or a pre-recorded, previously broadcast I'm not taking program. issue with that. But I will say that we may see some extraordinary occurrences in the uh, years ahead, and for some people of religious conviction, it will be it will have the appearance of the fulfillment of prophecy. Boy. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Hi, Art. Kevin, KEX, Portland. Portland, yes. Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, I heard uh, when Art described your biography that you went to Divinity School at Berkeley. That's correct. And I was just wondering, uh, like the last caller, a little bit more on your perception of how this relates with, you know, I don't know what religion you are or anything else, but how this relates with uh, 
uh, your morality or yeah if you could just uh, delve into that a little bit. all right or your theological background uh, what kind of clash has occurred for you there personally michael well um I, I i must tell you in all honesty it has not confronted my personal theology very much i i would like to say on behalf of all people of religious conviction that I don't that whatever we may learn about the truth uh, or, or the activity of alien intelligence, it will not, in my view anyway, challenge one bit uh, the basic suppositions of a of, of a divine creation uh, or a, a divine creator. I have my own personal convictions about that, and I don't. I have not heard a single thing anywhere in the UFO research uh, data file that has challenged that for me. However, I do think we have some belief systems on this planet which are going to be sorely challenged and we're going to have to be very very careful in how we interpret these events uh, we're going to have to uh, you know first of all we have to recognize that if if there is a god and i personally believe there is then then the only god that makes sense to me is a god whose imagination is vastly larger than my own and the possibilities that that god may may bring forward are, are possibilities which dwarf my capacity for understanding and i do not want to stand up and say that can't be because my god would never do such a thing michael could we be chasing our creator uh -huh. We could be in a sense. Um, but I want to be very careful about that, too. Because, you know, if we, Art, went to another planet that had only primitive life forms or no life forms, one of the things that we might think of doing would be to see if we could get life to grow on that planet. If we are talking now about going to the planet Mars, which is supposed to be a dead planet, although there may be evidence to the contrary, uh, if we went to that planet, we would set about to terraform that planet. That's already in the written plans, Art. If we went to Mars, we would try to make that planet a living planet after our own image. It is not the least bit inconceivable that other beings far in advance of ourselves came here and did the same thing. But that would not obviate the question of God. It would only say that we are part of a very large uh community of intelligent beings who are very much like us and run experiments like we do and may have moral issues like we do as well. All right, Michael, hold on just one moment. We'll come right back to you. And when we do, I'm going to ask you about the next, uh, the next uh, to me, obvious question with regard to Mr. Richard Hoagland. His discovery is not just on Mars now, but on the moon as well with some remarkable photographs. But back now to Michael Lindemann. Michael. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard Hoagland. I've been in close contact with him lately. Mm -hmm. Some incredible discoveries on the moon. I know that you have a computer. I don't know if you've seen any of the gift pictures of the moon structures yet, but if you have, what are your comments? Well, I had the pleasure of seeing Richard's presentation in Los Angeles a few weeks ago. Ah. So I've seen his photos. I want to say, first of all, I, I think uh, I think Richard is a real path, uh, pathfinder. He's a real groundbreaker. I don't agree with everything he says, but I have respect for the way for his, his courage in bringing forward these ideas. I think his basic concepts about the face on Mars are pretty well established. Uh, and uh, I, was a, I was slow to, uh, to uh, agree with that. But I will say there's a report that your listeners should read that really nails it down in a way that, it, to me, is indisputable. And that's a report called the McDaniel Report. It was published by right. North Atlantic Books out of Berkeley in uh, 1993. It is very important and your readers should read it because it establishes that NASA knows that there is something up on Mars and that the high probability is that that is an artificial construct which suggests the possibility that a humanoid type of life form Richard Holguin's analysis there, of course, is, is, is uh, nowhere. I don't have the, uh, the detail that uh, some of the other photos have got, but there are some structures there that really oughtn't to be there, and it takes somebody like Richard to explain why they shouldn't be there, and that has to do with the way erosion occurs on the moon. Mm -hmm. All the surfaces of the moon are of basically two kinds, either relatively new impact features, basically from the impact of meteoroids that cause uh, craters, and for a time, those features are rather jagged, but over time, because of the constant rain of small meteoroids, uh, 
you get a you get a wearing down, and all of the older features of the moon are extremely smooth, undulating features. Yes. In that picture, a couple of extraordinarily odd, out of place things. And here again, we have this concept of out of place things, things that oughtn't to be there. Less than a minute now. Okay. Well, we're talking about especially the one most impressive to me, and I think to others, is the so-called shard. A tower of rock which rises straight off the surface of the moon to a height of almost five miles. That's right. We've never built anything that big, Art. We have no idea how. And the thing, if it's if it is a thing, as it appears to be in several photographs taken from several different spacecraft at several different times, if it's really there, then it is most most unusual. It shouldn't be there. And we have to ask, where in the world does such a thing come from? And why? And uh, why? All right. Stand by. Uh, we'll come back to you right after the break at the top of the hour and try to get to uh, more calls this next hour. My guest, Michael Lindemann. You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. For what you think during our local talk radio programming, call Star 10 Tiger. All right, but due to satellite transmission problems, Talk Radio 102 FM presents a previously recorded Art Bell Dreamland program. Kingdom of Nine. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, I'm here. So is Michael Lindemann. Here's a fax. Art, great show. Thanks to both you and Michael. ETs, UFOs, really art. I've told you the Bible is full of this info. And of course, the rapture will simply be a massive beam me up, Scotty. And under the category of ask and ye shall receive with regard to red mercury, uh, somebody sent me an entire article that's going to bear some examination entitled Red Mercury. Is there a pure fusion bomb for sale? And so I'm going to do a little reading on that several pages here. Three pages, my fax limit, by the way. And uh, several more faxes without time to get to them. We'll kind of try and fit them in as we go. Michael, are you there? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I think that we ought to pay a lot of attention to the telephones this hour, if we can. Uh, so let's let's try it. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Yes, sir. Did this have... So let's let's try it uh, on the toll-free line. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Yes, sir. Did this have? I'm from Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, and, right? And uh, one night, everybody in Milwaukee saw this one uh, UFO going over the city. It was like it was playing a joke. But me and some friends of mine were given some. Uh, Papers. Do you remember Stephen Schwartz's uh, experiments with the Navy? Uh, when uh, when did you see this UFO? 72 or 73, I think. All right. And, and you say everybody in Milwaukee saw it? Was it in, uh, yes, you know? it was, uh, it, they were all talking about it on the air. And because I remembered how uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Heinemann... Uh, told us how to uh, how to judge how far it was by our thumb. All right, um, uh, by holding your thumb up, I guess. Huh? Uh, Michael, there have been a lot of sightings like this, like the one she talked about in Milwaukee, where massive numbers of people have seen something. Uh, is that part of the great body of evidence that leads us toward the inescapable conclusion that they are here? Well, Art, I would have to say it is. I, you know, it's, it's very interesting. First of all, uh, for, the, for this caller, to just to know, I, I was uh, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's sad to say I left in 1970, in 67, and didn't hear about the great Milwaukee UFO sighting of 1972. So if she has any newspaper clips, I'd love to have them. But I would like to point out that that period, 1972, 1973, was an absolute peak period for UFO and alien contact experience 
experiences all over the country, and some very classic cases occurred roughly between 72 and 75. For example, the fantastic abduction case of uh, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, which occurred in, I believe, 1973, the Travis Walton abduction, which occurred in 1975, lots and lots of other events which occurred all around the country. Of course, Linda Howe would point out that that period of time was a, was a very hot time for uh, abductions around the country. The mid-70s is one of the peak periods for that. So, we, yes, uh, we see, this is one of the aggravating things about the phenomenon, that it seems to come in waves. And we've seen some classic waves, and that was part of one of those waves. Are we in a peak or a valley now? Well, as regards sightings of craft, the classic sightings type, according to the fund, for, or according to the Center for UFO Studies, were in a valley. Oddly enough, however, it would appear that the phenomenon is changing, and that the nature of contact is changing. We are no longer seeing as many lights in the sky, but we're seeing a lot more gray more grays in the bedroom. That's a very different kind of encounter. I'll say. And I think it says something. We can't prove this, but I'll just go on. They have to do something. But second of all, I think the aliens are, have something to do with it. They are modulating a process. And I think that they have shown us lots and lots of lights in the sky for a couple of decades. You know, back in the 60s, it was very unpopular to even mention that there might be somebody on board, for crying out loud. You know, you were a bit of a lunatic, even in UFO research, if you said, well, what about the people who are driving the thing? And that has, of course, changed a lot. But it wasn't until the mid-70s that we started to get comfortable with that. And now, of course, come mid-80s, we're comfortable with the idea, well, comfortable is not quite the right word, but at least we're getting used to the idea that there may indeed be beings who are coming and meeting us, experimenting with us, if you will. We are conversant with the idea. In other words, uh, because of all the programs, sightings, contact, uh, the one coming on Roswell, programs like that, we're beginning to get to be conversant uh, with regard to the idea. That is correct. All right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Michael Lineman. Hi. Good evening, Go Art. John from Richland. Richland, Washington. Yes, John. The, uh, the facts on Red Mercury, I just sent you that. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to say was, uh, it's a cheap man's way of making uh, neutron bombs, and this stuff really does exist. But I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Lindemann a question in that regard, is that uh, do you think that uh, some of this weapons development is... Uh, is still based on some perhaps malevolent intentions on the visitors from wherever they may be? It is a good question. It's a kind of a natural extension of what you were saying earlier, uh, Michael. Yes, uh, it is. Why are we developing all this weaponry? Right. And if they're warm, fuzzy little guys... Why... Well, let me not... Let me not... Let me not be up to saying they're warm, fuzzy little guys. I didn't say that, and I'm not sure that's true. I would say there's a diversity of types probably present, and that some of them don't pose a threat, but some of them possibly do pose a threat. Certainly back in the 1940s and early 50s, our government, the, that is to say the secret faction that was dealing with this information, was quite convinced that we were dealing with some kind of an invasion, and they wondered if there was a military response. They tried a few tests to see if there was a military response, and they quickly learned that if we approached the subject in a military fashion, we would get blown out of the sky. There was really no contest. Recently, a military man said to me that they stopped interpreting it as a military problem quite a long time ago for the simple reason that there is no military response. That does not mean there isn't a military problem, but it does mean that we are not properly positioned to take a military action which actually gets results we want. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's a different problem. Therefore, it's a getting used to it problem. It's a handling the social perceptions problem. It's a, perhaps a diplomatic problem. There are people who think we're in diplomatic contact. I can't prove that, but I, but I have heard some stories which, I'm, which I think may be true. So we're faced here with, what do you do if you are up against overwhelming odds? If you are not only the military of some, you know, little third world republic, but you are actually, you know, you are the combined military of all the superpowers on Earth, you have all the guns and all the money, and you know there isn't a clue, there isn't a chance. Well, I know this. I wouldn't, uh, I'll go up to uh, uh, Michael Tyson and threaten to punch his lights out. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's very similar. Uh, you don't take a military attitude towards somebody who can... Uh, that's right, who laughs at you and then, uh, and then squashes see, you down like a bug. That's exactly right. right. Exactly. That's the problem. Now, there is no sign, or this is my personal interpretation of all available data that I have seen, there is no sign 
of an intention to take over the planet. There is no sign of overt hostility, but there are clear signs that if we initiate hostilities, we learn right quick who's in charge. Yeah. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Grants Pass. Grants Pass, Oregon. Yes. I personally think that uh, aliens are a lot of garbage, and the reason being that uh, the human mind... I see as the most powerful tool in the universe, and because of its power, it can uh, create or conjure up or any number of uh, ways you want to express it, uh, these phenomena. Now, uh, uh, the other thing is that in, in addition to that, uh, I see that man has always been in the universe, on the earth, and... Uh, uh, because of that, there have been many cultures, there have been many civilizations, and, and quite uh, possibly these uh, artifacts and uh, um, phenomena that we've been finding are a result of these past uh, civilizations. All right. Uh, what about it, Michael? Monsters from the id? Well, I, I, I didn't interpret him as saying only monsters from the id. I think that's one possibility. Basically, if we look at all the data, I think there are three broad possibilities. First of all, we have an absolutely extraordinary degree of human delusion. Delusion in people who test normal, who test intelligence, who <laughs> test non-pathological. Yes. That's one possibility. Possibility number two, some governmental or quasi-governmental entity is in possession of an extraordinary array of absolutely bizarre technologies, and they're using them with a vengeance all over the place with no visible agenda. But that's a second possibility. Third possibility is aliens. Any way you slice it, we've got a serious problem here. Neither one of those possibilities is trivial. We have to find out what it is, and, for, and to treat it with a completely open mind, we have to accept that some cases may fall in any one of those boxes. But I will say this. On balance, I believe data shows that the best probability is that some cases are alien. All right. And I will stand on that. All right. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Michael, uh, let me turn down my radio here. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Please do that. Turn it off. And also tell I'm us where... I'm calling from Seattle. Seattle. All right. Okay. Um, I got a couple of questions here. Can I shoot with them? Shoot, shoot with them, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, that Roswell mm -hmm. um, uh, thing, the declaration... Uh, my phone might be bugged, by the way, because of that. I hope you understand that. Okay, Michael? No problem. All right. Um, I told the person about it that has to write to you. He needs to know he has to tell you what he saw. No, he doesn't have to tell me anything. He just asked for the declaration. Just that's ask all. for the declaration. Send he can self. tell me if he wants to, but I don't. he doesn't have to tell me anything. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope, and that's all you need to do, ma'am. Okay, then the second thing I needed to tell is there was a woman from Port I've had a long time trying to get through to you. There's a woman from Portland that saw some circles in the land. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can get her phone number or if I can just report that on the phone here. Well, do you mean the, the crop circles that have been reported in the Portland area over the last couple of weeks, the recent reports? Yes, because in Wisconsin, uh, back in, um, oh, I think it was about 89 or 1990, mm -hmm. they were having a lot of crop circles in their land, too. And uh, they sounded uh, dignified like this former caller that just called and thought it was a bunch of crack that there were DUFOs. It was a small town and a lot of dignified folks and um, they uh, they saw these vessels and they saw uh, circles in their crop lands. All right. right, thank you. Yes, uh, we're very well aware of the Portland uh, crop circles, aren't we, Michael? Yes, we are. Uh, but I think it's important to note, first of all, the crop circles have been occurring in this country uh, in quite a few different states from time to time over the last number of years. It's not just an English phenomenon, of course. Now, we also have to say that we now know from the English experience that some crop circles, including some of the very unusual, large, highly ornate crop formations, are hoaxes. It is possible to hoax some of these, but it is also next to impossible, according to our best information, 
to hoax some of the features of a genuine circle, such as the work of, Do of Dr. W.C. Levengood out of Pinelandia Labs, the work that he's done showing the changes in the, in the uh, cell pit structure, showing changes in growth rates showing, and germination rate, various changes, even changes in the electromagnetic behavior of the, of, the, of the plant materials, saying that this is the stuff that can't be hoaxed. It takes real work to test this stuff. Mm. Now, that testing has not been done, to my knowledge, on the Oregon material, but Linda mentioned earlier that she's trying to get some samples. It would I'm be important sure, to find that out. That's right. I'm sure it's on the way. On the right. toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Art, how you doing? Just fine. Where are you, sir? Albuquerque. Mike from Albuquerque. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Lindemann. Yes, sir. Uh, my father was reading to me from a book by a, a man named George Andrews this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book, it states that in a, uh, in a one particular county in Pennsylvania in the 1970s, in a one-year period, there was over 130 UFO sightings uh, where the, there was an association with a with uh, Bigfoot. Are you familiar with any of this? Well, I, I, I confess I'm not familiar with the Pennsylvania sightings, but I am very definitely familiar with claims of Bigfoot in association with some UFO sightings. Bigfoot, of course, is another of these extremely strange uh, anomalous occurrences. There's good evidence that there is such a thing as Bigfoot, the Sasquatch up in the Seattle and uh, Northwest area there, and, of course, other manifestations of the same phenomenon in other parts of the world, other parts of the country. Right. Native Americans have been reporting this for hundreds of years. Um, there, is, there are a few cases, and I wonder how some who's brought some of these cases forward, where there have been sightings of a seemingly Bigfoot-type character uh, in association even with the cattle mutilation phenomenon. So there may be a link. I can't prove it, but I think so. Okay. Are you familiar with the, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Grover Krantz? Can't say I am. Oh, okay. He's a, uh, an anthropologist, um, uh, professor of anthropology at the University of Washington. Right. And uh, he has uh, a mass. He's been studying the, uh, the Sasquatch phenomena for a long time. And it seems now that there's uh, several scientists that are no longer are looking at the uh, the Sasquatch phenomena as a uh, let's prove its existence, you know, an anthropological standpoint. It's now being studied in a zoological standpoint. Right. What is it? Uh, well. Uh I, I mean, that's a rhetorical question. The question is not, it, it, well, we, they know it's there, but now the question is, what is it? Yeah, the, the, the biggest piece of evidence is the dermal ridges. Right. Are the fingerprints on the feet. Uh, that'd be virtually impossible to fake. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're finding them left and right. But I was curious if you, uh, you know, if uh, there was a, a large connection. All right, thank you. Um, and you do find there to be a connection. Well, no, I, what I would like to say is, since Bigfoot is a little outside my range of, of, of personal study, I would only say that there have been some researchers who have established a possible connection. I don't rule it out. I think it's a very provocative possibility. All right. Well, since we've asked about that, how about Loch Ness? <laughs> oh, sure. And after that, let's bring in... Uh, let's bring <laughs> well, in I mean, there has been serious uh, uh, scientific inquiry uh, uh, in well, Loch Ness, and they've, they've had readings. I don't want to make light of Loch Ness. I personally would be thrilled to bits if the Loch Ness monster exists, and there's a darn good chance it does. Not only there, but in Lake Champlain and, and, and the Ogopogo and, and some lake up in, I don't know, British Columbia or wherever it is. It is absolutely likely, Art, that there are lots of bizarre life forms on this planet that we haven't found. Every now and then something washes up on a, on a beach on some uh, uh, shore of some ocean. We find we've, with it, there's a whole new class of whale or a whole new class of squid or some other creature we've never seen before. Exactly. Eels 100 feet long. It's exactly. quite possible. Um, I'm not sure, however, that there is any established connection between uh, Loch Ness and UFOs. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Michael uh, Linneman. Hello. Where are you? Yes, this is Dan from the University District in Seattle. Hi, Dan. Hi. And, uh, Michael, it's been a few months since I've talked to you, but um, um, I was the one who called about asking questions about the reptilians a few months ago, and you were very kind and gracious in giving me your time on that information. Um, I'm wondering, have you ever ex uh, exchanged information with Mark McCandlish? Yes, uh, in fact, we had an interesting exchange on this very show a couple of months ago. I must have missed it then, because I was very um, fascinated. Yeah, well, actually, he... caller, that's what led to uh, the McCandlish appearance on this program. I see, okay. Yeah, uh, I thought he had a lot to say, and uh, I, uh, I'll go ahead and hang up, and I wonder if you could uh, just say a, a few words about his inf information on UFO technology. All right, uh, we'll do that. Mike Michael, hold on just one moment. Michael Lindemann is my guest. We'll be right back. For those of you who are having a hard time hearing it or straining to hear it on some distant radio station, my advice would be to call your local radio affiliate, the local radio station in your area, and uh, inquire about Dreamland. 
and toward that end, if you would like assistance, let me give you our network telephone number, and uh, they will give you assistance in trying to get Dreamland on your radio station. It is area code 503-664-5444. Now, do not call it now. Call it uh, beginning Tuesday during the business week. That's area code 503-664-8829. Michael, are you there? Yes, sir. Not a lot of time uh, before the bottom of the hour. Uh, let's try a quick call on the toll-free line. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Yes, this is Tom from San Diego, KOGO. Hi, Tom. Hi. I am an ESP researcher, and, of course, I'd like to have a, a couple questions with, with Mr. Lieberman. Uh, Edgar Casey speaks of the future uh, contact with UFOs, and ESP research uh, indicates that there is going to be sizable uh, Earth activity in the near future. How does this coincide with your 2020 uh, predictions of what we are going to be living through in the next five years with the rings of fire that are very active right now. All right. Uh, big earth movements, predictions by people like Casey, uh, true. Well, what I can say is that there is no geological precedent that we know of for the kind of earth changes that have been predicted by some people. For example, Gordon Michael Scallion, who, I, who, who firmly believes that the western third of the United States will simply be inundated. That's right. Um, I am not in any position to say these people are right or wrong, what I will say is that the probability that they're right is extremely low unless something absolutely unprecedented occurs on this planet. Which is, of course, what they're predicting. That is exactly what they're predicting. Um, I have to work from uh, from known information, known uh, trends, and I would have to say that in my view, the likelihood of Earth changes on that scale is extremely small. On the other hand, we know that the West Coast is a sitting duck for major earthquakes. No question. I live in Santa Barbara. I'm going to move. I tell you, I think this area is in for some serious seismic activity. All right, Michael, very quickly, about a minute left, UFO Technologies, going back a call. Uh, he wanted your comment on Mark McCandlish and um, uh, some of what he has to say. Actually, I'd like to comment on that in some length, so let's do it after the, after the, call, after the uh, break, but I will say very briefly, Mark has alerted me to two important things. Number one, uh, that it is quite probable that our government is in possession of what he refers to as alien replication vehicles. We can say more about that. And he has alerted me to a new generation of lighter-than-aircraft that we have built, which have nothing to do with alien technology, but which are mistaken for UFOs, and in particular for the very large diamond, or, or not diamond, but uh, triangular-shaped UFOs sighted in the western states. It may very well be that this is a lighter-than-air conventional technology. Like I, I would believe that. that, because it certainly would fit the one sighting that I've had. We will also give you the address again. Get a pencil for the Roswell Declaration when we come back. So get a pencil and a piece of paper and get ready. This is the CBC Radio Network in Dreamland. You're listening to Dreamland on Talk Radio 102 FM. Kingdom of Nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It certainly is. Tell you what, a couple things. One, we're going to restrict our toll-free line to east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, for the next uh, 25 minutes of the program. Remember, uh, only those of you east of the Rocky Mountains on the toll-free line at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies only. Now, um, in addition, I do want to get this out again. Very, very important. The Roswell Declaration, to get it, to sign it, to be part of it, all you've got to do is send a self-addressed uh, stamped envelope, no money, Self-addressed stamped envelope to Michael Lindemann, 3463 State Street, Box 264, Santa Barbara, California, 
Zip code 93105. 93105. Is that right, Michael? That's correct. All right, good. Uh, here's a fax that just came in. Uh, when Michael Lindemann mentioned the newly discovered age of the Sphinx, he must have been referring to the show broadcast a few months ago called The Mystery of the Sphinx. In the show, it was also reported that a new chamber had been discovered at the base, base of the Sphinx, as had been predicted by Casey. Unfortunately, the process of getting permission to open that chamber was being met with resistance from the Egyptian bureaucracy. Please um, ask Michael if he has any information on whether there's been any progress in this area. Well, I'm glad your uh, your listeners informed that is uh, everything he said is true. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have an update. I am in touch with some people who are monitoring that situation very closely, and I would like to uh, uh, you know check with them and perhaps comment on that next time uh, you and I talk, Art. And you could even pass it along to your audience if I'm not on the program. But right now, uh, I'm not aware of any progress. And, and the 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 uh, uh, person who faxed it is absolutely correct. The Egyptian government is very much. Uh, resisting this. Now, there's a reason for this. It's not just a question of whether you just go digging in Egyptian soil without permission. It is a... That could... I mean, in fact, the Egyptian government may be receiving pressure from other governments much more powerful than itself. Because if they open that that uh, chamber and uh, break loose a library of information that is more than 10,000 years old, there is no telling how many sacred cows will get butchered over that. All right, well, we'll stay in touch on that issue. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Hello, Mr. Lindemann. Uh, this is Todd in SeaTac. Uh, you've made repeated reference to Zachariah Sitchin and uh, his work to planet, yes. where he uh, uh, states that the ancient Sumerian tablets, of which they've found, uh, found thousands, um, state that the Nephilim, as they're called, came to Earth and genetically engineered Homo sapien from Homo erectus. Um, how do you feel about uh, Mr. Uh, Sitchin's statements and uh, the accuracy of them as compared to the Sumerian tablets? Mm -hmm. Well, First of all, you're asking me, can I read Sumerian and can I interpret the huge amount of Sumerian information in the manner of Mr. Sitchin? The fact is I cannot, and very few people on Earth can. So the fact is that very few people actually challenge Mr. Sitchin on the level of his scholarship. They certainly challenge his conclusions because they're, they're, they're outrageous. We can say that without any, you know, without any quibble, but the fact is that Mr. Sitchin is, is, a hand, is among a handful of people qualified to interpret this material. And I find his interpretation most fascinating, uh, but I, I really can't comment on it more than that. All right. Um, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Uh, good evening. Where are you calling from? St. Please? Louis. St. Louis, yes, sir. Mr. Lindemann. Yes, sir. During your talk, you mentioned the continuity of government program. Yes. I have a question. For your partner, Ralph Steiner, in a radio show uh, on the Pacifica station of Berkeley a few years ago, uh, showed military alien cooperation, collaboration, similar to Bob Lazar. Could this be a major reason for the continuing cover-up? Well, if it were happening, I would say that would be a very cover-upable kind of fact, okay? Now, I can't say it's happening, uh, but I will say uh, that uh, certainly the United States has built enormous underground bases. Whether there are aliens in them or not remains to be seen. However, I would like to point out a new book uh, that will not necessarily be well known to your to your listening audience that I think is very important. It's called Taken, and it's subtitled Inside the Alien-Human Abduction Agenda. It is by a woman named Carla Turner. And by the way, uh, uh, Art, uh, Carla would make a fine guest uh, for a future show. Carla is a Ph.D. professor, uh, herself an abductee, as is her husband. She has written a book about eight people, six of whom believe there were human beings working in some cooperative fashion with alien abductors. This, wow. of course, is an extraordinary claim, but yes. Carla is no fool. Uh, Michael, can you get me contact information? I sure can. All right, good. Uh, good. We'll look forward to it. She sounds good. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Where are you calling from, please? Hello? Yes, where are you, sir? Oh, Raleigh, North Carolina, listening on WCRY, UK Verena. Very good. I have a question uh, for your guest. Um, this harks back to uh, a comment that someone else had made uh, earlier in the show regarding uh, the, uh, <laughs> the differences of opinion, let's say, in the, among the uh, UFO uh, research uh, community. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, recently, I read uh, Jacques Belli's uh, book, Revelation, mm-hmm. in which uh, he, <laughs> uh, there's virtually no one in the uh, uh, ufology uh, research area that doesn't uh, come away with a bloody nose. Everyone from John Lear to Bill Cooper to uh, uh, Major Kehoe, everybody else. Uh, Vali is considered the preeminent ufologist in the world today. And yet, uh, reading his book, Revelations, you come away, his basic thesis is that much of the ballyhoo about uh, UFOs and, and uh, abductions and so forth is part true, there's something on, going on out there, but much of it is generated by the uh, military intelligence complex, and they've so well infiltrated and uh, co-opted the, the research efforts that it's hard to tell anymore who's telling the truth, uh, what's manufactured. That's what true. It? All right, I get, I get the message. Can yeah. I comment on yeah, that? Yeah, please go right. And it, it's a good one. And by the way, some of the people he mentioned are not at the center of the scientific community investigating this phenomenon. But that is true. Go ahead, Michael. All right. Bottom line, um, uh, I have great respect for Jacques Vallée. Uh, Jacques Vallée is an important, you might say, an almost a dissident voice in, in the UFO research today, but he, but he operates at an almost unique level of subtlety. And for that reason, he cannot be uh, ignored, even if he is making statements that make everybody angry, and he does that on a regular basis. Um, but the fact is that Dr. Vallée is basically saying our, our analysis tends to be too simplistic, too limited, too Western scientistic. We are trying too hard to squeeze a round peg in a square hole. This ufology business is not a bunch of aliens that look approximately like us driving around in Toyota spacecraft. It isn't like that at all, he says. It's much more complicated, much more subtle. And he's right. I'm convinced he's right. Now, that does not mean that everything he says is right. I think Dr. Vallée takes pot shots, sometimes because he's aggravated at the stupidity of some ufologists. Um, so I would say read his book uh, uh, with respect, but also take it with a grain of salt. Revelations in particular is a book flawed by a number of uh, simple factual inaccuracies, which he has had the graciousness to, uh, to cop to on a few occasions. Um, but um, Dr. Vallée, if nothing else, has done us a service by saying, look, um, it isn't all that simple. Guess again. Um, and he's also pointed out, that there may be a control system operating in which the aliens themselves are manipulating our perception of who they are. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the, uh, the caller also pointed out that the military has made such a hodgepodge out of the various situations that it's hard to tell who's telling the truth and who isn't. There's no question that that statement is true. Indeed, that is the very nature of disinformation. Jacques Vallée is right when he says that the whole field is loaded from top to bottom with deception. That deception is coming from at least three places. Place number one, our own military, our own government structure, which has had a huge stake in all of this deception. Number two, the aliens are foisting deception on us without a doubt. And third of all, of course, each and every one of us personally is prone to self-deception. This is an easy place to get completely screwed up and deluded, and we have to stop every couple of minutes and say, wait a minute, maybe I'm dead wrong. Well, all of that together creates an awfully large noise level, does You bet. A very large noise level. The signal is a very hard one to find, and you really have to hold out. I always say to my audiences, please do not jump to the ready answer. You need, above all in this field, a high tolerance for ambiguity. We don't have the answer. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Hi, Art. This is Linda from Maple Valley, Washington. Yes. Um, my question is, is it, uh, for Michael, is it possible that this wave is because it takes the such a long time to get here and get back and what does he think about uh, uh, different dimensions all right well the question of dimensions is an important one it raises all kinds of uh, philosophical as well as uh, of, of physical science level questions that I'm not prepared to answer. Uh, is it possible that they're flitting in and out of dimensions? Sure, it's just as possible th- that they're doing that as it is that they're traveling through time, which I regard as a possibility, or that they're using some sort of hyperdrive. I mean, for heaven's sakes, for the last 25 years we've been hearing that the Star Trek people have something that they call warp, and indeed, if we were ever going to really travel 
travel around the stars. We would need something like that. Jules Verne, a hundred years ago, said we'd be flying through the skies or, or you know, traveling in submarines under the under the ice caps. He was right, as it happens, but that was a hundred years ago. Now, are we going to come up with this technology? Maybe. Have they come up with it? Quite probably. Does it take them a really long time to come from star A to here? I doubt it. I don't think we would see the numbers we see if it was really a matter of them traveling years and years and years to get here. I think that is extremely improbable. There must be some other way to do it. All right, Michael, hold on just a sec. We'll be right back to you. Michael Lindemann is my guest. Still time to get in if you would like If you would like to try. I know the lines are awfully clogged, but uh, be patient. You will get through. Absolutely. Michael Lindemann, where are you calling? Oh. Yes, sir. Okay, here we go again. Uh, short on time now. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Where are you calling from, please? No, you're not. Uh, we'll go here to the wild card line. You're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Hi, Eric. This is Matt in Portland. Hi, Matt. Hi, Michael. Um, great, great show, Art. Thank you. Uh, Dan from the University District asked Michael, I, I guess on another occasion, about the reptiles. I'd just like to get Michael's input on that. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, not... about the what? The reptiles. Oh. Well, there are several kinds of aliens often described. The most commonly described in this country, of course, is the greys, the uh, uh, slightly built gray characters with the large black eyes. Uh, the humanoid type, the type that looks essentially like us, is the, most, is the next most often reported. And the third most often reported are so-called reptilians. Humanoid type beings that have rep reptilian type features, that is mm. perhaps scaly skin or skin of a greenish tone, mm. a very muscular build, a large claws in some cases, large uh, teeth, uh, odd facial features. Uh, do these beings exist? Well, I would say um, the answer is I don't know, but uh, the re reports are very, very frequent. And so if these people who are reporting them are crazy, then we have to assume it's possible that they could exist. They, they would be my least favorite. Uh, if, if you're talking about ones to meet up with, I'm not wild about reptiles anyway. On the uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. Yes. Uh, why should we know that aliens do actually exist? Uh, where are you, sir? Okay. Well, I guess we just missed that one. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Hello. This is Mike uh, calling from uh, Seattle. Hi, Mike. I'm a um, MUFON member up here, and uh, I uh, we're busily uh, getting out these uh, Roswell declarations also. Great. And uh, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, throw in an idea. What we're doing is uh, not only some of the MUFON headquarters, uh, uh, we're sending a copy, a uh, duplicate copy to our each one of our representatives. And I wanted to, if possible, give out my phone number because anybody in Washington State who wants to call me, I'll pay the postage and send a uh, copy of a blank uh, declaration to I'm them. sorry, caller. Without, uh, without checking it out, I can't just let to give out a phone number. Okay. I'm terribly sorry. Let uh, me just let me just thank well, the gentleman. Tell you though. what, if they want to come to the MUFON meeting at the Bothell Library next, uh, let's see, uh, on uh, July 16th, uh, they can get a copy there. That's fine. That's good. Let me just comment real quickly that uh, that part of the overall strategy is that when the there is a cutoff date, which is sometime in the late fall, I don't know exactly when. At that time, all of the declarations that have been received are going to be compiled, and they will be divided out according to congressional districts so that copies of the of, of of the declaration will be sent. The number that were sent from any district will be sent to that district representative, and the entire thing will also be sent to key members of the administration, including the president and the vice president. So, you're in effect, caller, you're 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 doing something that's a little redundant, but I think it should be done. I think your representatives should know, and I I applaud your effort. All right, good. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Well, goodness gracious, I finally got on. Yes, where are you? That pushed redial. Where are you, sir? I'm in Spokane, Washington. All right. And we're kind of remiss because we don't have any sightings around here very much. All we had was somebody shooting the hell out of about 21 people at the Air Force Base, and then about four days later, a B-52 crashed at the same place, and yes. nobody mentioned a thing about it. But well, on the other hand, I think this is fascinating. And I well, yes, sir. On my regular program, my syndicated program, we talked a great deal about what happened up there. Good, I missed it. Yes, I you wish did. you were on 
more in this in this genre of every night instead of uh, more toward the political thing but that's another well, now wait a minute you just complained about lack of coverage and i just told yeah, you we, we covered it and now you're saying you want this I, I'm not saying that you, <laughs> no you shouldn't have covered it the media should have i see anyway do you have a question you're a special entity um i don't have a question so much as i'm just in total awe of what's going on most of my experiences are spiritual in nature and and uh Gosh, this is this opens up a whole new area of bewilderment to me. What can we expect in the future? I mean, is this the the, the strange goings on in the sky that we're not supposed to look at that's described in the Bible, or what? All right, there is a good question. There's Mike. a good question. Well, uh, I think we touched on that earlier. Uh, there are, of course, many prophecies from the Bible as well as other scriptures around the world indicating this is a very special time. There may be events that occur over the next couple of years that have the that have the appearance of the fulfillment of prophecy. I believe we are going to uh, gradually, we are, as I said earlier, coming of age in the cosmic neighborhood. We are learning that we are part of a very broad, very diverse neighborhood of cosmic intelligences. Many of these beings do not look like us. Some seem to look rather like us, but we're just getting to know the neighbors, and we, in fact, are the new kids on the block. It's going to be a very interesting time. Yes, it will. On uh, uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Michael Lindman. Hello, where are you calling from, please? Southern California? Yes, sir. Hi, um, I had two questions. The first one is about the planet Jupiter and the impact of the comet uh, Levy Schumacher that's supposed to be... Shoemaker Levy 9, right. uh, the remnants of it. Yes, good question. And, uh, of course, you know, what, what sort of activity may we expect to see from here on Earth or up in the sky? All right, thank, thank you. We're going to have to hold it there. We're so short on time. Shoemaker Levy 9, the impact of the pieces. Well, as Linda said earlier, the impact will begin approximately July 16th. This is considered to be the greatest astronomical event of the century. Every telescope that is available on Earth will be looking at it. And, of course, we also have the Galileo spacecraft out near Jupiter right now that is going to try its best to take a look at it. Part of the problem the problem is that the events are occurring on the back side of Jupiter with respect to our vantage point. However, interestingly, the impact points are only approximately 10 minutes away from the horizon because Jupiter turns very fast. So they're hoping that they're going to see very large amounts of residual light and other manifestations of energy. They are calling these impacts the largest explosions that have ever occurred in recorded history inside of our solar system. Now, what will that mean on our planet? It it ranges from, it, depending on who you ask, it ranges from, it won't mean anything at all except a darn good astronomical event, out to uh, predictions by some people who may be a little bit shrill in their notions uh, that this could have very large, even catastrophic uh, events that it could precipitate, for example, earth changes. People well, think that, they, they, that this may be a yes. trigger. I frankly strongly doubt that scenario. So do I, I, so do I Michael. Do you think it's a big snowball or is it a hunk of iron? You mean what's coming in? Yeah. Um, well, according to our best estimates, it's closer to a snowball than a hunk of iron. All right, well, all right, uh, we're so short on time. Michael, uh, the Roswell Declaration, so important. One more time, give everybody, uh, a please, your address so they can get it. Right. Send uh, a stamped address self-envelope to, let's say that again, a, <laughs> a stamped self-addressed envelope, there we go, to Michael Lindemann, that's L-I-N-D-E-M-A-N-N. -N. The address is 3463 State Street, Box 264, Santa Barbara, California, 93105. And when you get the declaration, I would appreciate it if you would read it, sign it, send it in to the address on the declaration. But even better yet, when you get it, if you know people who might want a copy, make copies first, hand them out, and then sign it and send it in. So you not only don't object to uh, making copies, Please, you, you don't encourage do it. it. And uh, what about people who will make copies and then fax it uh, to other people? Is that legitimate as well? I see no problem with that. Make sure that they get both sides. However, it's a two-sided document. All right. Michael, we're uh, out of time. That's it. Uh, another wonderful appearance on the program. And, of course, we will have you back again. Thank you so much, Art. It's been a blast. And uh, if you get a chance to supply me with contact information on Carla uh, Turner, I'd sure love it. I will do that. Michael, happy to. Michael, thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care. Uh, Michael Lindemann, and I'm sorry, everybody, there is never enough time on this program. There is never enough time. If you would like a copy of this program or any 
Dreamland program. Uh, the number to call is area code 503-664-7966. Once again, and you can call it 24 hours a day, the magic number is area code 503-664-7966. They will get you a copy of any Dreamland program we've done since the inception. Thank you all. Good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.